Aunt Judy, my mother's sister, loved pretty clothes. If you were wearing something she admired, she wouldn't say, that's a nice outfit. She'd say, does that come in my size? <laughs> Do they have it in taupe? <laughs> Everything she saw, she wanted to wear. When I was five years old, she worked in New York City's garment center, the clothing capital of America. That's where she met Igor. He was a Peruvian truck driver who drove racks of dresses from designer Ola Cassini's showroom to A&S, Bond with Teller, and B. Altman, the finest stores in New York. Now, those stores no longer exist, but some of those clothes are still hanging in my closet. At the time, Cassini was a prestigious designer whose gowns graced movie screens for almost two decades. He'd just become the designer to then First Lady Jackie Kennedy. For her, his signature style was simple dresses in sumptuous fabrics, meticulously tailored and featuring oversized buttons and boxy jackets. Cassini designed and reported 300 outfits for the First Lady. Remember that number. Uh, because the part of this story that I find interesting is how these Cassini outfits got to my Aunt Judy. <laughs> she was a sexy blonde, and she was perpetually tan, which was not easy in New York City before the invention of tanning spas. So uh, she was frequently stopped on the street and mistaken for uh, movie stars of the day like Connie Stevens or even Marilyn Monroe. So it was easy to see how Judy could get what she wanted. So she struck a deal with Igor the truck driver. Every Friday, if you bring me a dress box filled with three to five size 10 Cassini dresses, I'll give you $10 cash. <laughs> At the time, truckers made 60 bucks a week, so it was a win-win for everybody. <laughs> Today, this kind of transaction is known as shopping off the back of the truck. Okay? Once a month, Judy got together with my mother. The two would tear through four to five boxes with the giggling glee of teenage girls on Christmas morning. I was the goofy kid sitting on the bed, rolling my eyes and giving opinions on the glamorous, stylish dresses. The blue and burgundy suit would look good for my mother's coloring. Judy tried on the same suit in brown and beige, perfect for her. Both sisters' fashion addictions were quelled for a while. <laughs> After a year of weekly dress boxes, almost as many dresses as Judy could wear to work without ever repeating an outfit, Igor made a request. Judy, you've been so nice to me and my family. My sister Jocelyn wants to move to New York from Peru. Will you sponsor her? What do I need to do to be a sponsor, she asked. Just sign some papers, Igor said. Barely batting an eyelash, Judy countered. Sure, I'll sponsor your sister if I can have two extra dresses a week. <laughs> the deal was struck. More dresses came to both Judy and my mom. Silks and woolens, jackets lined in fabrics matching the blouses. My child-sized self envied their dress-up parties. Each dress fitted sleekly and zipped up smoothly. I wished I was their size and shape so I could wear these glamorous outfits. I used to say, when I grow up, I'll wear these clothes. The dresses and suits kept coming. Then, in November of 1963, President Kennedy was shot. Photos appeared around the world of Jackie crawling out of the motorcade convertible, wearing a pink suit with navy trim, drenched in bloodstains from the assassin's bullet. Her reign as first lady was over. A week later, Aunt Judy revealed a version of the same suit. Instead of pink and navy, this was taupe with forest green. She said, when I took it to the cleaners to get the blood stains out, the cleaner changed the color. <laughs> My mother scolded her for the dark humor. The boxes of dresses ended. But the classic ta tailoring and fine lines, both sisters kept wearing the suits, always looking stylish. 
One day my mother told me she was wearing one of the suits when she walked into an elevator in the garment center to go to her office. She turned and faced the front of the elevator. A man behind her coughed to get her attention, then tapped her on the shoulder. She turned to look at him, and he smiled. It was Ola Cassini, the designer who saw it. Years passed, though both sisters now work for clothing designers and maintain their fashion plate status, they never quite experienced the volume of the Cassini years. <laughs> they both remained eager for next season's clothes half a year earlier. That's why in the early 1980s, when Judy received a diagnosis of brain cancer that would eventually result in blindness, she grabbed every catalog she could from the finest stores. Before she lost her eyesight, Judy ordered a spring wardrobe of pastel-colored silk blouses that matched fitted silk pants. She knew she'd be spending time in hospitals, so she ordered elegant nightgowns, peignoirs, and bed jackets. When boxes of beautiful spring clothes arrived, Judy was in hospice, never to see or wear the new spring wardrobe. She did ask for her son David to bring the boxes to the hospital so she could caress the fine fabrics against her cheek and have the fashionista thrill of new clothes. When Judy died, it was David's uncomfortable task to return the unworn clothes still in boxes with their tags on. As he stood at the return desk in Bloomingdale's patrons online behind him, oon and odd, stating, that's so pretty, why is it being returned? A tear came to his eye. David's next task was to take all of Judy's dresses, blouses, and pants, lovingly selected, worn and maintained, and share them with women who knew and loved his mother. That's why I have clothes in my closet, similar to those worn by the First Lady in the White House. In the era of Mad Men, they're super stylish again, just like this. <laughs> when I wear this, I'm back in that time with Judy and my mom. They're young and vibrant and fashionable. Wow. Thank you. Oh.